What's up YouTube? This your man, Dark Energy, coming to you live. And in today's video, we're going to be delving into this book right here entitled The Delectable Negro, Human Consumption, and Homoeroticism Within U.S. Slave Culture by Vincent Woodard. Uh, he has passed away. I want you to get you a pen and a piece of paper so you can take notes. And... In my last video, I have made a reference to this book right here, Mummies, Cannibals, and Vampires, okay? But before we go into this book, we have to go into this book, so in order to, for us to understand what's going on in that book, Mummies, Cannibals, and Vampires. So, let's read the back of this, okay? So it says here that, the delectable Negro. Now let's look up word, let's look at what the word delectable means. So delectable means delicious, mouth-watering, appetizing, flavorsome, and flavor. Or meaning consumption or eating. Okay? So it says the delectable Negro uncovers uncovers a compelling set of themes. And a scholarship on U.S. slave culture, white cannibalism, as a significant trope for white depletion of and desire for, and the laboring and eroticized black male body. In a stunning series of arguments, Woodard forces us to reconsider the historical out of hand rejection of black African fear and not really claims of white cannibalism. Showing how remarkably how reaching was the sense that slavery satisfied some saddle macho machoistic instinct on instinct among the slave owning class. All right, so here So here you have the context right and you have one and uh Chapter 5, it talks about eating Nat Turner. So, people say that Nat Turner wasn't real. Or there isn't it, there is any type of uh, historical documentation on Nat Turner. Well, the reason you can't find any documentation or any photographs on Nat Turner because he was eating. So, I can't go into all of this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, can only, I can only go into bits and pieces of it. So, this is in the uh, introduction, right? And it says here that Despite our will to forget and desire to reconfigure the past, the reality is that institutional, uh, institutionalized hunger and practices of human consumption Character, characterized life on many southern plantations. No topic disturbed and mystified 19th century America like the subject of human consumption under slavery. For most, for the most part, whites during the time responded to this topic as Mr. S as Mr. Swellfellow with an air of secrecy and shame. For example, one of the most notorious incidents of literal black consumption from the 19th century involved members of the whaling ship Exus, which sailed from Nantucket, Massachusetts in 1838. White Nantucketers still today have little to say about the incident, especially the fact that the first four crew members to be murdered and eaten by whites were black. Nantucket was known in the 19th century as a Quaker, an abolitionist stronghold and its residents then and still today find it hard to explain ship captains operating as slave drivers, African persons treated in a brutish manner aboard whaling ships, and more importantly, the master slave ideology informing the consumption of the four black men. Now, we want to go here. So you have here the transatlantic origin of black consumption. 
The origin of this U.S. culture of consumption traced back to the first contact between European colonizers and coastal Africans. So like, okay, so it says by the early of 20th century, even Europeans admitted to and documented a connection between European global expansion and a sexual appetite for African flesh. Now, when we go here to mummies and cannibals, it's, he, he says that the that cannibalism cannibalism is Europe is a, is Europeans. Okay, let's keep on going. So they have here a cartoon published in French journal. In, 19, in 1911, demonstrates how Europeans' hungers for conquest sometimes coincided with a homosexual hunger for African flesh. In the foreground of the cartoon, a porter, soldier, and general gather around a Bancongo man stabbed into a skewer. The Bancongo man spins around and awaits the slice of the butchered knife resting at his knees. So he's... Right? And then you have it down here. Okay, this is the picture. Okay. Um, let's keep on going. Okay. And it says here that this cartoon depicts a widespread belief in Western and Central Africa that Europeans were cannibals. Groups such as the Igbo, Bancongo, Fanti, and Guinea all thought of European interlopers as cannibals. A century earlier, for example, Ali Azimi of the Borno people in Nigeria described his encounter with a, quote, European cannibal in a manner laden with terror and homoeroticism. Izemi is transported as a slave throughout many Western African regions. Slave traders finally bring him and a group of kinsmen to the home of a white minister in uh, Bathurst in 1818. The minister comes out of his home and surveys all of the slaves. He takes a market interest in Izemi who recalls, who recalls that the, quote, recalls that the man quote took hold of my hand and drew me into his house according to Izemi and the other Africans assembled the white man strongly desires him takes a delectable interest in this born new man now let's uh, let's keep on going right and we, this is just in the, this is just in, in the introduction okay so we're gonna go here. One second. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to go here to. We know about Ola Uda. Equiano, right? And he even asked the question when he was taking aboard a slave ship. He said, I asked him. He was on a, he was taking aboard a slave ship called the African Snow. And he says, Cole, I asked him if we were not to be eaten by those white men with horrible looks, red faces, and long hair. Now, I want to go here because I'm, I'm just going through different parts, right? Okay. Now, I'm going to go here right here. So it says consumption of the under new slavery. The charming Sally frequently transports, transports slaves from Africa to the Caribbean. As a result, Equiano spends a significant amount of time in Barbados, Montserrat, and other parts of the Caribbean observing overseers who he describes as human butchers. 
practicing their cruel trade. One of the first narrated examples of this cruelty is a, quote, Negro man staked to the ground and cut most shockingly. His crime involved being, quote, connected with a white woman who was a common prostitute. While staked to the ground, the overseer, bit by bit, cut off pieces of each of his ears. Prolonging what was already a horrific and unbearable punishment. It was common practice in the Caribbean to not only cut off the ears of slaves, but also to broil to bro them and make the slaves eat the broiled pieces. That's punishment. Are you hearing this? Anglican missionary John Wesley documented this, this phenomenon in his thoughts upon slavery. He writes, quote, after they are whip, uh, after they are whipped till they are raw all over, some put pepper and salt upon them. Some drop melted wax upon their skin. Others cut off their ears and constrain them to broil and eat them. Are you hearing this? In this way, the slave was made an accomplice to, to his or her or or her own social social consumption. Such acts of auto can cannibalism, self consumption, reinforced for the slaves the interrelation among punishment. Slavery adds a slow, incremental death to the body and soul, and the general culture of slave seasoning as a process meant to prepare the slave for all manner of consumption. In the 1700s, John Atkins, a surgeon in the British Royal Navy, recorded a insurrection that had occurred aboard a slave ship. The captain and crew quelled the insurrection and as punishment made the, cap made the captured African persons eat human body parts before murdering them. Quote, three others, abaters, uh, but not actors, nor of strength for it, he sentenced to cruel deaths, making them first eat the hearts and liver of one of them killed. The correlation in this, in this example between execution and death by consumption is noteworthy. Rosalind Shaw observes that among conflicting cultural groups in the colonial era, such acts of auto cannibalism reinforced the militarized and legislative authority of a dominant group. It says, quote, Not only do we consume you, the captain of the British Royal Navy conveys, but we also make you consume each other. Are you hearing this? Let's keep on going. I'm going to go over here. And it says here that uh, I want to go here to right here. The state of pleasure that Equiani describes connotes horror, objection, and human vampir and human and human vampirism. All right, human vampirism. In this context of social death and energetic exchange, pleasure operates as one an organic unit, a life-sustaining energy readily bartered and exchanged during slavery. A process of internalizing and imbibing spirit and soul force. In rituals of blood, consequences of slavery in two American country centuries, Orlando Patterson approaches this dynamic from the perspective of an of the enslaved person. Are you hearing this? I'm going to drop down here. It says, Patterson analyzes Jim Crow lynching rituals as ancient, ancient sacrificial rites, cannibalistic features, and attempts to feed a deity of terror and appetite usually referred to as God. So when black people were being lynched, that was a form of, that was a ritual. 
trying to soul harvest. Let's go over here. If I have to make it, if I have to make two parts to this, I will. So now we're gonna go here to right here. Sex, honor, and human consumption. Now I want you to listen to this. Lil Burn Lewis, a Kentucky slave owner, owned a considerable number of slaves whom he, quote, drove constantly, fed sparingly, and last severely, according to the abolitionist Lydia Maria Child. Lewis was a typical plantation owner whom most in the local community probably respected and looked to as a model wealthy citizen in terms of his treatment of his slaves. In 1826, he would commit crimes against his slaves that would cause his community to ostracize, ostracize him and pursue legal restraint. He committed suicide while awaiting criminal trial. It is hard to say from the evidence if George, a uh, young recountered slave on Lewis Plantation was a favorite of was a favorite or if Lewis or if Lewis constantly chose him as many masters did as the object of ritualized violence and as an emblem of his manhood and noble social uh, stature. All we know for sure is that George, like many on the plantation, often went hungry, suffered the lash too often, and grew to despise and resent his condition of bondage. George pro provoked his master's penchant for punishment by frequently running away in addition to disobeying. Sent to the spring one day to collect water into a elegant pitcher, George made a made the horrid mistake of letting the pitcher fall and standing by and watching it as it quote dashed to shivers on the rocks as a punishment for George's transgression his master bound him to a wooden plank and in the manner of a butcher quartered him with an axe and cooked his severed body parts and pieces of flesh over a billowing fire. In preparation for this ritualized punishment, Lewis gathered all the slaves on the plantation, quote, into the most roomy Negro house. He bolted the door and told those assembled that, quote, the design of this meeting was to teach them to remain at home and obey his orders. The ritual begins with George's younger brother helping the master bind the slave to a wooden bench. Listen to this. George was called up and by the assistance of his younger brother laid on a broad bench or a block. The master then cut off his ankles with a broad axe. In the vein, the unhappy victim screamed. Not a hand among so many dare to interfere. Talking about how come the slaves didn't help this man escape. Having cast the feet into the fire, he, the master, lectured the Negroes at some length. He then proceeded to cut off his limbs below the knees. The sufferer besought him to begin with his head. It was in vain. The master went on thus until trunk, arms, and head were all in the fire. Still protracting the intervals with lectures and threatenings of like punishment, in case any of them were disobedient or ran away or disclosed the tra tragedy, they were compelled to witness. In order, in order to consume the bones, the fire was briskly stirred until midnight. Are you hearing this? This is how he this is how they kept this is how they kept the slaves in check. They said, look, if you niggas run away, this was this what's gonna happen to you. Okay. Um you have Christian 
Christian cannibalism. It says, we are more pain than surprise. Therefore, to find a great Massachusetts Senator, Daniel Webster, taking another step downward. He has published a very appropriate and we doubt not very satisfactory argument in support of the legal, moral, and religious obligation of slave catching on the part of law-abiding citizens and Bible-loving Christians of free states. It is a, it is a literary, literary monstrosity which will make the fortune of the antiquarian who shall hereafter bring it to light. When Christian slaveholding shall have become a, as difficult of comprehension as Christian cannibalism. Now, you have here, okay, so I want to do is, I want to stop my video right here. I'm going to come back and make a part two to this. I'm going to make a part two to this, okay? Because you have eating, eatings, blacks at sea, right? And they were eating, they were, these white people, these Europeans were eating black people. Okay? So all that stuff about reptiles and greys, no. These are people. Europeans eating black folks. Like right here. You have here. In the Nantucket community, the uh, ship, the Exus ship, Captain George Polar and other crew members, Benjamin Lawrence, Gideon Flogger, and Paul Massey, among others, displayed when their ship wrecked off the shore of Henderson Island on December 20th, 1833. The quick-thinking captain had the crew immediately move all the ship's provisions to three boats that had been left intact. He devised a plan for braving the, sh the sea and rationing their provisions while they searched for other whaling ships to rescue them. And even when the crew having exhausted all their provisions, resorted to human cannibalism, the captain still managed to maintain, maintain a semblance of order and cohesion reflective of the honor respected according to the crew. Now we're going to keep on, we're going to go over here. So now they're, they're, they're in the captain's log, right? This is what they're talking about, what's going on on the ship. So it says, the captain's log reported that a black man and one of the boats accompanying his died on January 25th and was eaten. On January 23rd, a black man in a captain's boat died. And his body was shared for food between the crews of both boats. On January 27th, a black man died in the other boat. And on January 28th, yet another black man died in his captain boat. Both of whom were eaten. Human consumption at sea was not an unusual occurrence at the time. It was unusual, though, that the first four black persons eaten among a crew of black and white men were black. Okay? So, then you have here, like I said, you have to get the book for yourself. So like here, you have here, The Taste of Nat Turner. The taste of Nat Turner. So, what, what these white people did was they just, they uh, did defamation of character to Nat Turner's name, you know what I'm saying, and, and things of that nature, and they ate him, and they admitted. Okay, it's like right here. It says whites had to dishonor Turner, disfigure him, and make of his person a legacy of monstrosity. Such a tragedy of character assassination deflected attention away from the real brutal circumstances of slavery that, it, that initiated Turner's revolt and the incidents of literal consumption that informed the execution of Turner and the, treat, and the treatment of his corpse. After Turner was captured, he was hung, skinned, and bled, and his body was boiled down to boiled down to grease. 
blacks of the region around this time swore off the consumption of castor oil. According to William Sidney Drury, a late 19th century historian, quote, the famous remedy of doctors of antebellum days, castor oil, was long dreaded for fear it was old Nat's grease. Are you hearing this? Right here. Yet, since slavery Southampton's whites have made a mockery of black observation of white cannibalism and denied the same observation made by whites. In a 1931 editorial, J.S. Musgrove cites from a his history text that documents the consumption of Turner. So this is documented. They have this documented about these white folks ate that Turner. That's why you don't have any pictures of this dude. The excerpt reads, listen to this. Nat's body was boiled up, his oil saved, and sold for a long period as a panacea for all ills and known as Nat's grease. Musgrove refers to these documented observations as pure, unenlawed bulk. He retreats in a typical mode of white denial. Yet when one thinks about the boiling down of Turner's flesh in an inquiring manner to make sense to ask for what purpose did whites use his liquid, liquefied flesh? Was it used to cook food, oil the body for ingestion, ingestion as medicine or for some other domestic use? Working from a largely unrevised notion of the folk, scholars have failed to see the, the inherent layers of inquiry and the folk's refusal, refusal to eat Nat Turner. It, it would have been much simpler to hang, bury, or burn the body. Why go through all the effort involved in bleeding the corpse and boiling down the flesh? Why preserve the liquid flesh of one so hated and feared? Why behead him and secretly preserve the skull? So, this book's entitled The Delectable Negro, Human Consumption, Homo Eroticism Within Human, Within U.S. Slave Culture. So, once you finish reading this, now you can go over to this book, Mummies, Cannibals, and Vampires. So, it said that Nat's Turner, they was using Nat's Turner's uh, body for grease and oil. Now this is going to tie back into carbon. Carbon is oil. Melanin. Right? Um... Okay, so like here, we go back here. All this stuff is tying in. We're gonna go here. So I got a minute left. Let me hurry up. So I showed in my last video in 1920 that a chemist showed, was telling you how to uh, um, scan black people of their, of their uh, melanin, their carbon. Right? So, this is entitled The Delectable Negro. Okay? And in my next video, we're going to go into this book, Mummies, Cannibals, and Vampires. See you on the next one. Peace.